I want you to come with me to the book of Psalms. Strange enough that Dave read out of Psalm 34. Because just keep your Bible right there and just stay in Psalm 34. How about that? <laughs> you see how this starts? See how this starts? Hallelujah. So friends, today I want to share with you a little bit more of where I ended off last time. Remember what I spoke about last time? It's all about how much value do we put on hearing from God. Today, I'm going to give us some keys to living the right life. So those of you who want to take notes, one of the things, one of the aspects that I mentioned was, is that I've learned this from our senior pastor, Brett, is that the moment that I start engaging in writing down, writing things down, and revisit that, and look, I go, well, God, I believe this is what you're saying to me, and write it down. There was astronomical growth in my spiritual life. So I want to encourage you to take notes, write down, even in your, in, your, in your prayer time, in your quiet time, take your Bible, and whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is prompting you, saying to you, to write it down, so that you can always revisit that. It's powerful, powerful. So, I can live my life and I can live it the right way. I can choose. I can live it the right way or I can live it the wrong way. Correct? And we know that God said that this life does not belong to me. I do not belong to myself. Therefore, I can't just do what I want. But I can choose to live my life right. I can choose to live it wrong. So Psalm 34, right here we find the first key to living our life right. So we're going to be reading from verse 1 to verse 4. So here we go. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Listen to this. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. So when we begin to magnify God and we begin to praise God, that brings the deliverance of all my fears. So the start of living the right life is first, is the right atmosphere. So we spoke a little bit about that, is that God responds to atmosphere, amen? So you, have you ever walked into a room where someone was overwhelmed with sadness? You walk into that room and you can feel the sadness in that room. It's almost tangible. Someone that's angry, they project from their spirit that, that negativity, and when you're in that room, in that atmosphere, you can, you can sense that. Am I making sense to anyone here? So God responds to the right atmosphere. If someone is afraid, even fear, that creates an atmosphere. Now the way that I can get God's favor and draw his blessing into my life is to make sure that I create the right atmosphere. Because God responds to the right atmosphere, but he, there's some that he does not respond to. So the atmosphere that he responds to is one of thanksgiving. The right atmosphere in one word equals praise. See, here we come again. It's coming back again to praise. His praise shall continually be on my lips. One of gratitude and one of praise. A heart filled with such gratitude that I come to magnify his name for who he is. And his praise will continually be in my lips. 
continually. Now think about that, regardless of my circumstance. But I've got a heart of worship, a heart for praise. So I can, in the midst of that, I can praise Him. And look at that, that is what's going to position us to draw from that goodness of God and His favor upon our lives. There's a story in the Bible about King Saul who was diagnosed with depression. And he was troubled by demon spirits. Remember that? He was troubled in his mind. And in 1 Samuel 16 verse 23, we see there, so for the sake of time, we've got heaps of scriptures. We're going to be reading others. I'll give you the reference. You can write them down, go read them for yourself. But just for the sake of time. So in 1 Samuel 16 23, we see where King Saul had been troubled. And he called for King David. He called for David to come in and then to play and praise on his harp. So as David was playing his harp and filling the temple with the sound of praise, the Bible says that those spirits departed of him and he was at rest and it was refreshment to him. Who of you needs refreshment? We go through times of dryness where we, we need refreshment. This is where our refreshment comes from. It's when we engage in praise, when we come and we magnify. What does it mean to magnify? If I say, hey, come and magnify the Lord with me. What does it mean to you? If you take a magnifying glass, I've said this in the past, I've used it, you know, with, in all sorts of situations, playing with it as a kid, you know, working out, well, how does this work? Apart from my grandfather, you know, just looking like something out of the book of Red Riding Hood, you know, when he held it in front of his face, with all big eyes that he's had. I used to burn up crickets and little critters, you know, it was like, oh, wow. So what was I doing? I was harnessing, well, how big is the sun? The sun is massive, it's huge, it's big. So I'm harnessing all the power of the sun, all the power of that great sun, and I give it that focal point. I give it that intense focus. So in the same way, if we say, come and magnify the Lord with me, what are we doing? We are not making the problem a mountain, but rather we are giving God that focal point, the focus. We make him big. Amen? Because how can you make him bigger than what he already is? We can't. But we give him that centered focus. So it's a condition of the heart. And what is the atmosphere in my life? What kind of people do I have around me? Because that's also what creates atmosphere around me. Are you negative? Or are you positive? Is it with people that are fear-filled or are they faith-filled? Not just that, what kind of music is it even that I listen to? Where's one of the little kids? I just want to give you a quick dem little demonstration. I saw this when I was probably about, well, I think, 13 years old. Jaron and Noah. Paper, scissors, rock, quickly. I want a little helper. Come over here. That's a Jaron. Give, everyone give Jaron a little hand there, please. Okay, Jaron, I have not called you before to tell you that we're going to be doing this, have I? Have I? <laughs> no, I haven't. No. <laughs> That's the right answer. Now, Yubi's going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to repeat something. And you keep repeating it, keep repeating it, and then I'm going to ask you a question. But the moment I ask you the question, you have to immediately give me an answer, okay? You're not allowed to think about it. All right? You ready? So, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to repeat it. And repeat it and repeat it and repeat it as fast as you can. And then I'm, the moment I ask you a question, you immediately answer me, okay? Okay, I want you to repeat the word pots. Okay, pots, pots, pots. You're doing well, keep going. What do you do at a green light? Stop. I'm 
Everyone give Jaren a good hand, thank you. So what just happened? The guy that explained that to us said to us, when I was a kid, came to our school. He said, watch out for the music that you listen to. Because there's some of the backtracks that if you play it backwards, there is encrypted messages within the songs. Now that's back when I was 13. I'd rather not say you don't tell what your age is, but that's many, many years ago. It hasn't changed. Now Jaron is very smart. I hang out with that boy a lot. He's smart. So just now, what happened? Because if you look at pots, you change it around, it spells, stop. What do you do with a green light? You stop. Oh, and you said, I oh. don't. So that's the effect that it can have. And really, this is serious business. It's not something we can toy around with. The devil is out to get you for the enemy has come only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So we got to be on our guard. What sort of atmosphere have I got around me? What am I listening to? God is drawn to some atmospheres and he withdraws from some atmosphere. He's looking for atmosphere of gratitude and of praise. That's what he's looking for. After all, we read it in the Bible that God inhabits the praises of his people. He loves it when we have a joyful sound coming from our heart. Praising him for who he is. For he's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. That brings us to number two. So key number two is you have to have the right source. Hey, Davy. I've seen it when I was an apprentice in a workshop in the city of Pretoria at Primos College. The teacher said to us, when you hook up a motor over here, your daddy is not going to pay for it. I'm not going to pay for it. I'm sure your boss is not going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it. And the way that you're going to pay for it too is, is not just by replacing it, paying for the damage, but he had a big, he called it a polony. It's this big, and you had to cut like a two mil little page. He said, I want to print the whole Bible on these little tablets, so I'm looking for someone to cut some up for me. So that was the penalty. Is that the new? If you blew it up, the wrong source. If you put the wrong source on it, my goodness, you're in trouble. He's going to malfunction. So we got to make sure that we have the right energy source. If I fight the flesh and I have an issue and I'm dealing with the flesh, I only fight against myself. If I have problems, struggling with all sorts of maybe addictions, and issues, and I fight it with the flesh, that's a losing battle. Who knows that that's a losing battle? Because it's the flesh. So we don't fight the flesh, we need a supernatural energy source. And the supernatural energy source for the believer is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible talks about praying in an unknown tongue. It talks about praying in an unknown tongue. When you and I pray in the spirit language that God gives us. Come on, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. You read it in your own Bible. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And the first verse is going to be verse 2. Listen to what it says. For he who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So number one there, we are speaking to God. <laughs> For no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. We speak mysteries. So I'm asking you at the same time while I'm preaching is that you do a little bit of evaluation and self-reflection in your own life 
Because if we read further up, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, look, look, listen, listen to what Paul said. He said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. This was part of Paul's daily prayer life, was to speak in tongues. There's some dominations that one tries to put that down. It's like, no, that was only for in the upper room. It's no more. It's come and gone. No, it hasn't. It's part of the believer's life. This is how we stay connected to our supernatural energy source, which is the Holy Spirit. It's for every believer. We got to be fired up. God is going to bring some fire this morning. Hallelujah. I, I know it. I know it. I can sense it. But this is what we need to be engaging in. This is the business of the believer. We have to, we have to create an atmosphere that's going to attract God, which is praise, which is thanksgiving. And not only that, but we have to have the right energy source that we are connected to, and that's the Holy Spirit. And how do we stay connected? We speak in that unknown tongue because we do not speak to men, but we speak to God. Not that anyone's mind is fruitful when we do it, but we speak mysteries. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39. Listen to what it says. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. I have to. It's part of my life. It's part of my, my Christian DNA. And God wants to draw that out of us. We're going to see now later on on how it is that God does that. But we need to get fired up. Hallelujah. When we pray in the Spirit, that is our energy source. Isaiah 28, verse 11 to 12. It speaks again about this refreshing. Isaiah 28 and verse 11 and 12. Pleasure, brother. The previous one was 1 Corinthians 14 verse 39. So Isaiah 28... Verse 11 and 12. Listen to what it says. For with the stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And listen to this. This is the refreshing. This is the refreshing. You need refreshment for your life? Start engaging in the Spirit. Start engaging in the Spirit. Get connected to that source. It's up to us to flick the switch. The power is right there. It's there. But I'm not benefiting of it, even though it is there. But I need to be connected. And then i got to flick that switch. i got to engage. i got to engage in the Spirit using that language. Speaking to God, giving utterance to these mysteries, hallelujah. Because through that, God brings a refreshment to your soul. We need that. In this day and age that we live in, even so more, we need that. Romans 8.26 You know, when we are filled with the Spirit, when we are filled with the Spirit, we will not look down on one another. If we are filled with the Spirit, it would be so easy to love one another. If we are filled with the Spirit, I am mindful of another, not just myself. It's not something that I'm trying not to do. It's empowerment that comes by the Spirit that leads me in it. I'm not trying not to be selfish. But the Spirit of 
God is that driving force. If I'm connected to that power, it empowers me to love like he does. After all, Jesus gave us the command that husbands, you ought to love your wives as I love the church. He's poured his love. Romans 5.5, 5, he's shed his love abroad within our hearts by his spirit that he has given unto us. So we have no excuse. But if I'm filled with the spirit, hallelujah, that's the empowerment for me to do what he wants me to do, to do what he wills me to do. Because remember when we spoke out of Ephesians 5, man, this, the word is so rich. But in Ephesians 5, talking about be filled with the Spirit, remember that sermon? To be filled with the Spirit? One of the things is, is, is that we submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. There will be a submission. I wouldn't find it hard to do. It's like ah, kicking against the strains. Because Paul said to us, do not be drunk of wine, but be ye. Be ye filled with the Spirit. It's a command. We ought to do it. We ought to grasp hold of this. It's a serious matter. Be filled with the Spirit. It's right there. Go read it in Ephesians 5. I think it's from verse, from Mary 18. From verse 18. It says there, what's part of it? Praise. It says, speak in psalms to one another and spiritual songs. That's another one. Making melody in your heart unto the Lord. That's another one. This is how we get filled. <laughs> then he says, submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And what does he say then? He says, and give thanks unto God through Christ Jesus, always for all things. See, there's thanksgiving again. We have to create that atmosphere if we are going to draw from the blessings of God into our lives. This is not a wishy-washy idea. This is God's way. Amen? This is, interesting. This is, this is very interesting. You know, in World War II, when the Japanese had bombarded Pearl Harbor, and the Americans were losing. Do you know what they did? They called upon the people of Anivo. Now, Anivo was an Indian tribe people who have, they have a significant, like, significant language that's been handed down from generation to generation. So they got some of these Anivo tribal people within their ranks and placed them in the platoons. So what they did is, is, is that all the messages from all the superiors have been relayed to the Anivo people who would then have the walkie-talkies and they would speak and give these commands to one another where they stationed. And the Japanese, they intercepted all their messages. So they could understand English. But the moment that these Anivo people had been talking in their language, none of them could understand it. How good's that? And there was only 17, 17 of them amongst the whole American army, the whole fleet. Now, how powerful is that? I'm asking, how powerful is that? So what am I trying to say? Listen here, listen. This is what I'm trying to say, is that we do not have to play fair with the devil. We can go straight to the throne room of God. We can go straight and speak to God, hallelujah. We don't have to play fair with the devil. We are not ashamed of the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what we believe. This is what we stand upon. We believe that this is the doctrine of the apostles. We are not ashamed of the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit will change your life. The Holy Spirit will change a weak man and make him strong. The Holy Spirit will shake up a man that is bound and addicted and it will set him free. This is what the Holy Spirit does. So we believe in the working of the Holy Ghost. 
We believe in it. He will cause you to love God with passion and with fire, man. That's the Holy Spirit. Where is He? Where is He on our journey? Paul is talking about, he, he, he urges us, he urges us to have communion with the Holy Spirit. Communion with the Holy Spirit. When was the last time that you had communion with the Holy Spirit? Come on, this is serious stuff. But allow God, allow God just to, to highlight in our lives and give us a kind of a marker on, on where I'm at. Lord, I need to sharpen up on that. When's the last time? What's your communion look like with the Holy Ghost? If He is the source that we need, and He means everything. Praying in the Spirit. That's our energy source. The right atmosphere, thanksgiving and praise. The right energy source, praying in the Spirit. And then we have to have the right information. Who knows that right information is essential? If, ah, that's it. So if you want to end up where you think you're going, you're going to need the right information to get there. You take a wrong turn, you know, you get Siri rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. Take the next roundabout, third exit. Ah, ah. Why did I miss that? Now what it does is it delays me because I've got to go all the way down the highway and now it's like a five kilometer, you know, like detour. It's frustrating. It's frustrating not to have the right information. So we have to stick. We have to stick to the book. We have to stick. We have to get the right information. Listen to what Jeremiah 15, 16 says. Jeremiah 15, 16. This is so good. So Jeremiah 15, 16 says the following. Your words, talking about God's, so God's words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. <laughs> Listen here, if he says the joy of my heart. Oh, when I first laid eyes on Toinette, as a young man, that's one of the most joyful moments in my entire life. Thank God it was so awesome and brilliant and great that I can never forget it to this day. It's imprinted right there. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's good. That is good. But he says here, listen, listen, your words were found. So first of all, I've got to find them. But they are to be found. So, your words were found, and then I ate them. You see, a lot of us, we hear the word. But the problem is, is that we never seem to get it down. We don't get it in. So Jeremiah's talking about here. He says that I ate it, and I, I, I got it in me. And listen to what he says then. He says, and your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Birds of a feather flock together. So if I come and I am whinging, whining with you, Brett, complaining, and you jump on that bag wagon, yeah, you know, I feel you, brother, I feel you. Are we complaining together? We just double the problem in size. God, hallelujah, we need to get the right information. We need to get the word to stir up our hearts. So that there's a rejoicing in my heart when I hear the word of God. It's like, Lord, they say this. 
What is the future of my family? My wife, I thank God for my wife. She stirred this so up in my heart. We need to listen to our wives. God's given them to help us. I'm so appreciative of my wife. Thank you, Tony. I love you so much. You helped me so much. Man, what does the Lord say about your family? What does the Lord say about your future? Let the rejoicing come from what it is that the Word of God is saying. Let what's in here be the sweet honey, the sweet tasting honey to your lips. After all, Joshua 1 verse 8 says too that we ought to not allow this book of the law to depart. From where? From your mouth. But meditate therein. What's meditate mean? It means to utter, to roar, to speak, to roll over and over in your mind. The Word of God. We ought to meditate on the Word of God and not allow it to depart from our lips. So that we can deal according to all that's written in there. And then we will have, it says, great success. So where's successful living? A successful family. Where does it come from? A successful future. It's in there. It's in the word, but I've got to speak it. We've got to get the word in us. Once it's in there, I'll be able to speak it. That's the word of faith. Near you is the word. It's in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith that you speak. Hallelujah. Oh, the Spirit of God is going to stir us up. Come on, there's a stirring up here this morning. And then we read in Judges 6 and 7 that there's a story of Gideon. The Midianites took over the Israelites. And God came to, <laughs> he came to Gideon. Where was Gideon? Gideon was hiding in a cave. And the angel came to him in Judges 6, verse 12. Let's go and read this. Let's go and read this. Judges chapter 6 and verse 12. So now I want you to get this picture. Dave said that you should use your imagination and imagine biting into that sweet nectarine. I want you to get this picture of Gideon. Hallelujah. It's so good. Oh, hallelujah. Judges 6 verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. He is hiding in a cave. He's like, Oi, mate, you got this all wrong. I'm a wimp. I'm no mighty man of no valor. <laughs> He didn't feel like a mighty man of valor. He felt like a wimp. But God said, you're not a wimp. Gideon, you are a winner. I want you to move past the point of feeling this morning. Because when we look in this word, we're going to see something that is completely contrary to what we feel. It speaks differently to what we see. But this yet reflects the truth, hallelujah. It's about who God defines who I am and what I am. So we're going to break this down a little bit. God said, you're not a wimp, but you're a winner. You're not a weakling, but you are my man. (laughs) What was God doing? God was getting the right information to Gideon so that he could get that picture on the inside of him. That's what he was doing. God wanted him to be aware, be aware more than his fear and the overwhelming circumstances. He wanted him to get a different picture on the inside, one of him in victory. God does not call you like you are. Listen to this. God does not call you like you are, but how you are going to be. The moment you get the word in, it will speak the opposite of what you are experiencing. 
That's what happened with Gideon. And Gideon then goes on and, oh my goodness, listen to what he says in verse 15. Listen to him. So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is on the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. What's God trying to do? He's trying to get the right information to Gideon. He's trying to say to him, You are my man. You're not a weakling, you're a winner. And then what did he do? He come with complaining. Oh, I'm born on the wrong side of the road. I do not have the skills. I'm the least in my, my, my father's family. I'm the outcast. Who of you sometimes feel like that? That you got lost on the wayside. You're by yourself. No one's aware of you or what it is that you are enduring. This is a wake-up call. God is speaking to us. And I believe that there's a shaking happening. There's a shaking happening that God wants us to awake from the slumber sleep that some of us might be in. He wants us to rise up. He wants us to be refreshed. He wants to get the right information on the inside of you. My way of giving you victory is by getting a different picture in your mind. Then you know what God did? He said to Gideon, after this, what did God do? God said to Gideon, Gideon, I want you to go down into your enemy's camp. And I want you to go and listen to how your enemy perceives you. So Gideon went down. The Bible says that, they, that you went down, some of his men, and they hid behind rocks. And they were sitting there. And some of the Midianite guys had come, and they'd been talking, 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 talking about Gideon. And how afraid they are of Gideon. You know what happened? Gideon started to get a different picture on the inside because he now heard of what it is that God said to him. God sent him to listen to how it is that his enemy perceives him. And now, what's happened? At long last, he got that word on the inside. See, this is how important it is that the word get on the inside of us. Let us not just be hearers, but doers of the word. The time for just listening and listening and listening. Listen here. The very fact that I come to church and I sit in the pews doesn't make me a Christian. The very fact that I just come to church and I sit in the pew doesn't make me a Christian. Christ Jesus is the one who makes me a Christian. And the word of God is not something I can just hear, but I need to be a doer thereof. So the time of just hearing is over. God is bringing a shaking, an awakening for us to get this refreshment from the Holy Spirit so that He is the source that we are connected to. And the empowerment for us to do the will of God because we can't even do that on our own or out of ourselves. We need the Holy Ghost. So Gideon gets this picture on the inside. And then he responds to what God says. And there was a great victory. So allow God to change that picture that you have of yourself as a weakling. God sees you as the head and not the tail, man. He sees you as victorious, as loved, as blessed and highly favored. When's the last time that you just got a little bit of that Holy Ghost anointing, you know, where you just been in your inner room, you know, and just speaking. I do that underground. I speak underground, you know, it's just in the dark. 
I was just kiana masunda bayende. It's like hallelujah. I am the head and not the tail. If my God before me, who can be against me? I said God, I rejoice in you. The same as King David. He made wild movements, that they, the Bible says, with his feet. I can't because I've got all sorts of stuff, screwdrivers hanging off me, and I can get hurt pretty badly. But, you know, I control it, you know, in a certain way. But, hallelujah, we need to engage in these things, hallelujah, in the spirit, and get excited about the word of God, and speak it. Man, there's something about, we've got to hear more of when we get together about, ah, oh, praise God, hallelujah, thank you for the word of God that says, that I am overcomer. We, we testify about the goodness of God by taking his word and putting it on our lips and declare it. Right at the start, you took your Bible and said, you declared, you made a declaration, I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. But if we're just going to listen to it, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to have any effect. We have to allow it to get on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Ooh. Then, next, <laughs> we need the right location. 1 Kings 19 verse 21. It's one of those scriptures for the sake of time. But 1 Kings 19 verse 21. Elisha the prophet was met by Elijah. And Elijah said to him to follow him. Now who here wants the double anointing that we know that Elisha got from Elijah? Everyone would put their hand up for that. We all want that. Elijah said to him, you've got to be with me and be in the right place for when I go up, that you can get it. So we've got to be in the right place. We have to have the right location. And 1 Kings 19.21 is straight after Elijah the prophet said to him that. Elisha did something remarkable. I suppose his family might have been in the agricultural business, but he went and he had 12 oxen and a plow. And he went and he broke up the plow. That signifies his security. Everything that we put our security in, that we rely on, he broke it. And he decided to full-heartedly follow. God wants all of our heart. Are we willing to give that to him? Have you ever read that scripture? You ought to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and try and fathom God, but how do I do that? He wants it all. Once again, let the Holy Spirit, let's just allow the Spirit of God to guide us as we reflect on our own lives. So the right location. Religion can be the plow that is in need of breaking for some here this morning. Trusting in what was and what used to work might be the plow that is in need of breaking for some here this morning. The breaking of old mindsets might be the plow that is in need of breaking for some of us here this morning. But God wants us to deal with that plow. The next one, the next key for us to live our lives right is the right people. Proverbs 27 verse 6 it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Honesty. Honesty. I shared this back in South Africa. My mentor was the pastor that led me to Christ as well, and my dad. But he was a mentor for me. And we used to cycle together in the mornings and go and pray together. So he took me under his wing. And one day after we finished cycling, about... 25 kilometers, we usually drove into his dad's yard and then just fall down. I know, 25 k's. It was only at the start. But in any case, I can clearly remember we just laid there, out of breath, and he just asked me, he said, Ivan, 
What is a true friend? And I thought, I said to him, oh, it's someone that's there when you need them, someone that you can, you can trust, someone you can have fun with, you know, that share the same interest. And I said to him, so what is it to you? And he said to me, it's all about the honesty. Someone that could come to me and say, hey, man, you're mucking up. You're messing up. Never heard of that before like that, you know, said like that. But once again, wow. I need to go buy you a bouquet of flowers after this because, my goodness. Once again, I've got to point to my lovely wife. She is such an honest friend, and I love her for that. But once again, coming back, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord as one of the means of receiving the infilling of the Spirit of God. Am I humble enough to humble myself to take that? If you see me mess up, I want you to come to me and tell me, Hoy, don't do that. Don't talk to your wife like that. Mate, come on. You know the way you dealt with your child. You follow what I'm saying? If we are people that are filled by the Spirit, listen to what it says. It says that a faithful, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Are we that transparent? Listen to what we sang there this morning. Transparency. God is calling us. God, look, look. God is calling us to something deeper. He wants to deal with all of us. He wants us to be transparent before him and bring these things and lay it down. It's essential for us to, to do that. So am I willing to be vulnerable enough? If I struggle with something, to talk to one of you and come and say, hey, brother, I'm... Can you pray with me? Because you know what? I'm, I'm really finding it hard in this area. Come on. What is it that stops us from doing that? Fear? Pride? It starts showing what it is that God wants to deal with. So if I'm going to serve him with all of my heart, I have to bring that to the table. He wants to deal with that. But yet we find it so hard to say, God, Bob, oh, I, just, I, just, I, I, I just can't. I just. God wants to get the right information on the inside of us. And we will, we will be mature and, and loving enough to deal with one another in the love of God. The second one, or the one after this one, is the right focus. We've got to have the right focus. Job 42 verse 10 was the turnaround in Job's life. And the Bible says that when Job thought of the others and started praying for them, that's where the turnaround in his life, his life came. And God turned it all around. It's when he, when he was others focused. Not focusing on his bad days. Not focusing on a hurt that he was experiencing. And the mishaps that he had. And the heartbreak and the pain. But he focused on the others, on his friends, and he started praying for them. And what happened? God turned. God turned the situation around. There's a breaking that comes when we start doing God's will, God's way. But we first have to allow him to get that picture on the inside of us. And then when he says to move, boy, you better be moving. Job 42 verse 10. The turning point for Job came when he took his focus off his pain, his problems, his bad days, his hurt, and he put his focus on others. 1 Kings 17 12, very well known. The widow that prepared the last bit of resources. And she said that I'm going to prepare this for me and my son and then we will surely die. 
the prophet came and said to her, go and prepare me a cake first. She had a choice. She had a choice where she could have gone and she could have prepared it just for herself and her son and surely died. But look at this. Here you have a widow with a seed and you have a prophet with a need. And she took the seed and put it in his hand. What happens? There was a multiplication factor because of that. Why? Because she was others focused. She said, I'm not going to be focusing just on my own need, even though I am in need, but I'm focused on another. You see the power there is in that? See why God wants us to actually bridge that gap? By the empowerment of his spirit, hallelujah, so that we can live there. How hard is it when you are going through whatever it is, a struggle, to be mindful of another? If I try and do it out of myself, there's no way that I'm going to be able to achieve that. But by the Spirit, but by the Spirit of God, hallelujah, if it burns like a flame on the inside of me, there's going to be an empowerment for me in those moments. To be thoughtful of another. Life Impact Church. What's our vision? What's on the floor plan of our vision? I've been impacted by the life of Christ to impact another. It's scriptural. And look at this. That widow had endless supply for three and a half years. For three and a half years. We just need to take God by his word. We need to take him by his word. And then lastly, the right timing. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1. And just in closing, can I just ask a team to come up, please? Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1. It says that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under the heaven. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A season for every purpose. Purpose is connected to timing. Everything we are believing for is just on the other side of not giving up, mostly. Everything that we are trusting and believing God for is just on the other end of not giving up. We need to know what time it is on God's clock. We need to get our clock in sync with God's clock. And some of us might say, it's time, Lord, it's time. Why hasn't it happened yet? It's time, Lord. When are you going to do something about this? It's time, Lord. And God's saying, get in sync with my clock. We need a fresh revelation that my time is in God's hands. The time... My friends, it's now. The right time to serve the Lord is now. The right time to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with His fire is now. You might have put it off like, God, yes, I will when, whenever, I, whenever 2024 comes. Lord, I'll give my life to you when the time is right. The time is now. Some might have their own time clock. When I'm going to get right with God. When I will surrender to God. When I will get filled with the Spirit. When I will run after God with all that is within me. But God wants us to synchronize our time with His time. And His time is this morning. The time is ticking on our destiny. It's ticking and it's ticking on our destiny. No more attracting wrong atmospheres. The time is now. The wrong energy source. The time is now I'm dealing with that. 
to be in the wrong places with the wrong crowd and with the wrong focus. The time to deal with it is now, God says. We have the floor pan to living right life, the God kind of life. And somebody needs to get right with Jesus this morning. God's time is now. So we're going to worship right now. And whatever it is that the Holy Spirit has prompted you, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. It's not for me. But I want to encourage you. Do not let this moment slip by. For some, this might be the last time that you ever hear the gospel preached. How do we know? But do not let this moment slip by. The evidence of repentance. I've read that. Someone posted on Facebook. The evidence of repentance is not crying. But it is a changed life. How powerful is that? But godly sorrow can come with tears. That leads to true repentance. But the evidence is, is that there's a changed life. And the cry of our heart ought to be, God, I want you to, I want you to change my life. I want to burn for you with passion. I want the Holy Spirit to be the one. I want to set my sails to the wind of your Spirit as you take me, my God, on this journey. It's a time for us where we need to come and break the plow. Break that plow. Everything where you put your trust in other than God. Let there be a breaking of that plow this morning. Because God wants your heart. He wants all of you. We have to come to the place where we say, Lord, no more. No more. I will surrender to you. I'll get filled with your spirit. I'll run after you with all that is within me. I'm synchronizing my clock and my time with your clock, Father God. I'm doing it right now, this morning. As I know that time is ticking on my destiny, Lord. No more attracting wrong atmospheres. No more, Father God, wrong energy sources. No more wrong places. No more wrong crowds. No more wrong focus. Break the plow. Break the plow. I could just hear God say that. Break the plow.